We're going to deal with this idea of kingship and the passion. And what we've got to notice is, first of all, how bizarre and even hurtful it must have seemed to the people who experienced the crucifixion um, to associate kingship with it at all. So take a look at um, Mark's gospel. You know, as you probably know, Mark's gospel seems to be the, the oldest of the gospel accounts that we have. It certainly comes from one of the oldest accounts. So it gives us a perspective on uh, what things, how things looked and how things felt from the very beginning. Uh, so let's look at how this issue of kingship feels like to the disciples. How do, what does it look like from the very beginning? It was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him, what he's guilty of, read, the king of the Jews. So just pause there for a second. So if I'm experiencing the passion in real time, you know, in the moment, it feels like the word kingship is being used as an accusation, pure, pure and simple. And with him, they crucified two robbers, one on his right, one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. And then the whole charge of kingship is going to come back in that context of derision and um, the sense that he's nothing more than a common robber. So also the chief priests mocked him to one another with the scribes, saying, ah, oh, he saved others, he can't save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, you know, said with a certain amount of derision again, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And those who were crucified with him also reviled him. So if you want to go back to the origins, the connection of kingship to the passion is only something apparently that just amplifies the pain of the crucifixion. It's not enough that they're putting him to death, that this great movement of so much hope has come to an end. To add insult to injury, as it were, to throw salt into the wound, is to, um, uh, to deride him, to make fun of him, oh, the supposed king. This is obviously the opposite of kingship. Look at this, this is nonsense. So in this perspective, kingship is only a point of greater um, pain coming out of the derision. But something very, very peculiar happens. As Christians continue to reflect on what happened that day, including ones who were there, that whole theme of Christ's kingship emerges as something that is just overwhelmingly, astonishingly beautiful. It becomes one of the greatest gifts on that day. Is seeing how, actually, would you believe it? Um, Christ is actually really a king on that day. It's not just a point of derision. It's actually true. There, it's hard for us because you and I have heard the phrase Christ the King so many times and you sort of take it for granted. You can't leap over that first step. The first step is connection of kingship to passion equals even greater pain. It only intensifies my sense of loss and hurt. So this translation, this transition that happens to where it becomes like, I think I've got to sit down, I'm in it woozy. That's what we're trying to see in this meditation is, how is it that Christ's kingship being revealed on the cross overwhelms the early church and becomes a point of great joy to the point where you're like, um, you know, uncontrollably uh, uh, laughing, uh, joyful, overwhelmed with this unexpected reality. Where do we see it? John's Gospel, which is apparently the last of the Gospels to be written, and most importantly, is a Gospel that is written as the fruit of many, many years of 
contemplating again and again and again what happened. It's why it's so helpful to have four different Gospels because it's kind of like the image I love is, um, go back to the museum kind of analogy. You see a sculpture, but if it's a really great museum, they've got it freestanding so that you can walk around it and see it from a different angle. And then you see it again from another angle and you, keep, you make the 360 around the sculpture. It's the same exact sculpture, but as you keep walking around it and seeing it from different angles, the truth of it emerges with much greater clarity. John's Gospel is the gospel seen from another angle. And what allows us that angle is more and more reflection on these things that we experienced in the light of time and the Holy Spirit. So when John finally wants to set down his gospel, his starting point is informed by that. Years and years of contemplation and the awe and the sense of being overwhelmed by what happened that day. The first line of his entrance into the Passion narrative tells you the whole story, and it's right here in 13.1. Maybe the fulcrum of his entire gospel. When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. We're going to see that come back uh, in an important way. To the end. A little bit of an ambiguity there about what the word end means, but it's going to be clarified very quickly for us. Is it just the end in terms of time? Or is it also the end in terms of like the lowest last place? So, if everything in Mark's account seems out of control, they're making these accusations against Jesus. It's, people are, the people who are in control are the ones who are in the least best position to be in control. In John's narrative, after many years of reflecting on this, you get a profound sense of Jesus and the Father being in control, not out of control. So that everything that's going to unfold with all of its messiness, with all the chaos that's going to ensue, is going to be permitted in order for some remarkable thing to emerge. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, so the chaos is already beginning, Jesus, once again emphasizing, in control, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, hands, that he had come from God and was going to God. So nothing out of control here. Rose from supper, laid aside his garments, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to do the thing that is the dirtiest task at a dinner party in the ancient world. He washed the disciples' feet and wipe them with the very towel that is tied around him. Here's the key for us. Peter finds this unacceptable. And he does not understand what's going on. He came to Simon Peter and Peter says, Lord, do you mean to wash my feet? And then Jesus answered, and I think John must have reflected on this for years, year after year. What I'm doing now, what I'm doing you do not know. You don't understand. But afterward, you will understand. That's the whole story of the, the arc of John's gospel. What I'm doing right now in the moment, which Mark is very faithfully going to communicate to us, you don't understand. But give it time, and it will emerge, and then you will see, wow, this is what's going on. That's why John's gospel is so important. It gives us the other end of this arc. And it is... Um, Therefore, really intriguing and extremely significant that the central theme of John's Passion account is Jesus is King. I've given you a few little passages here, but I encourage you to go back and take a look at uh, John's Passion account, particularly in, in chapter 19, the core of it. And you see the word King come back over and over and over. 
the principal thing that John takes after years of contemplation is Jesus reveals the glory, the radiance of his kingship precisely in this great chaos. But in order to get there, we have to sort through true and false ideas of kingship. True and false ideas of glory. And Simon Peter is the one that helps us with that once again. So Peter, who cannot accept his Lord doing this humiliating task, also wants to maintain the sense that the Lord ought to be elevated above others. And so he follows the way that you traditionally protect an ordinary king in the garden, having a sword, he drew it and attacked. The high priest slave cutting off his right ear, Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the chalice which the Father has given to me? In control, see. I know what I've got to do. I understand that there's something that has to be uh, completed here. So the band of soldiers and their captain, the officers of the Jews, seize Jesus and bind him. They lead him to the ones who function as the de facto kings in um, Israel at that time, um, on the Jewish side of the hierarchy. They take them to the high priests, Annas and Caiaphas. It was Caiaphas, John notes, who had given counsels of the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Now, why is that a key for us to understand kingship? Well, because Caiaphas is the one who is actually operating as effectively a king. He has kingly authority in a certain respect at this point in ancient Israel. Um, and John notes that, hmm, God actually takes his kingly authority seriously and lets him definitively speak uh, words that are actually true, that are actually binding. So notice this, you've got to go back to John 11. It's the next little passage down. You've got to go back to John 11 to see um, how uh, John is noticing Caiaphas, who holds a kind of kingly authority, making authoritative statements. Here's what he says back in 11. Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to him, you know nothing at all. You do not understand that it's expedient for you that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. And again now, year after year of reflecting on that, and John's like, huh, that's actually right. He was actually speaking something authoritatively, definitively true. He did not say this of his own accord, but because he had this kingly authority, the, the authority of the high priest, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation and not for the nation only, but to gather into one the children of God scattered abroad. Okay, so we've got another layer here of kingship. There's the confusion about, is kingship just an allegation made against Jesus in order to put him to death? He's an interloper. He's usurping power. Or is there going to be a deepening sense that actually he is um, in control of everything and like a king in control, he will allow things to emerge in his good time to manifest uh, his authority. Keep going. Pilate is working in the same framework of kingship that Simon Peter is until Jesus gets inside of his head. Works his way all the way to the center of Pilate and makes him come unglued. And it's interesting to see this unfold. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no crime in him. You know, being, uh, being uh, obedient to Roman justice there. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and by that law he ought to die because he's made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard these words, here's the beginning of the change for Pilate. When Pilate heard these words, he was even more afraid. More afraid, which means he was already afraid to begin with. He can tell the kind of natural authority with which Jesus presents himself. So he entered the praetorium again and said to Jesus, where are you from? It's kind of like asking someone their name, you know? Or in St. Louis, what high school did you go to? 
I tell them, I went to a school in North Carolina. They're like, okay, we don't care. But Jesus gave no answer because he's in control. Totally different from Mark's account. Pilate therefore said to him, you won't speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Operating with this other understanding of kingship. And Jesus says to him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. So the one who delivered me to you, delivered me to you has the greater sin. So he's, we're, he's coming, this is a direct confrontation between this kind of standard understanding that everyone there has of kingship and Jesus, this very strange kind of natural authority that he has where he has to let the Father's plan unfold. He has this kind of strange uh, posture in front of Pilate. And here's how we know that it made it all the way to the center of Pilate's consciousness. Because he insists that he's actually going to indicate that Jesus really is the king of the Jews. Now, it appears from the other gospel accounts that Pilate may have done this in part just to belittle the Jewish authorities. But, I don't know, spend some time with it in prayer. There's an indication that um, Pilate is deeply shaken by this man, Jesus. Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And of course, everyone reads it because it's near the city, written in Hebrew and Latin and Greek. And the chief priests can't have any of this. They said to Pilate, don't write the King of the Jews. But the man said, I am the King of the Jews. And Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. It is authoritative. It's like what happens with Caiaphas. Caiaphas has the kingly power, and so whatever he does authoritatively has that meaning. Pilate has, on behalf of the Romans, the kingly power, and so what he does simply has the authoritative meaning. It is simply the case that Jesus is declared actually as the king of the Jews. Totally different understanding of that now from John's perspective as from Mark's perspective. It's like, here's the definitive statement. It has been said this man is the king of the Jews. So there's this kind of sense of awe that's developing. Okay, but we've got to go much deeper now because what does kingship really mean? And here's where John's entry into the passion gives us the key. What is Jesus' kingship? He loves to the end. He loves to the end. So what does love to the end look like? Well, as a matter of fact, it looks like the crucifixion. That's actually the glorification of love that goes to the lowest and last place. That's what, in fact, being really sovereignly in charge of oneself looks like. It means that I can make a total gift of myself. I'm not constrained in any way. I can just give it totally. Look at this passage here, reigning as king to the end. Um, take a look at the second uh, paragraph of that section first, where you see Jesus in possession himself all the way to the end. Again, knowing knowing with certainty that all is finished, he said, carrying out the mission of his father, I thirst. And uh, when he received the vinegar, he says, it is finished. He's the one who declares authoritatively, I have done what the father asks of me. What does it look like to go to the lowest and last place? It looks like childbirth. That's the weird thing about John's account. Where is kingship expressed most? It's expressed in the birth that happens at the cross. So go back up to that first paragraph under reigning as king to the end. Um, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, which is always necessary if you're going to give birth. There must be a mother. And his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved to the end, standing near, he said to his mother, woman, guess what? You've given birth to a son. And to the disciple, look, this is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into everything that was his. For John, this is the great mystery of the cross 
is that it is a place of new fruitfulness. It's a place of new birth. But that's what kings do all the time. Kings are the ones who um, put on great banquets. They sponsor the birth of culture. They are, in fact, the head of the family of the nation. And, um, I mean, it only takes opening, watching the opening scene of, of The Lion King that everyone rejoices when the new baby is born. You know, you lift up um, little Simba, you know. What the king does is express the life of the family of the nation, of giving birth in ever new ways. And so for John, when he goes back to begin his gospel, he's going to start with that notion of the cross as giving birth to children of God. What is the authoritative act of the king? Giving birth to new life. Where does it happen? At precisely this place of the cross. So here from the prologue of John's Gospel. The true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. The great surprising mystery. He came to his own home and his own people received him not. But it doesn't matter. Because to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children. So he knows, you know, knowing that everything had been given to him by the Father, he loved his own to the end. What does it look like? It means going all the way to the cross so the great act of new birth can happen. That's going to be the center point of his whole mission where he's going to give birth to the church. Children who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God, authoritatively. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth, and we have beheld his glory. There is no gospel, there's no part of the New Testament that more emphasizes glory, doxa, in Hebrew, chabod. There is no account that more emphasizes glory than John's. And why is that? Because John has had year after year after year to let this reality deepen within him. That on the cross, Jesus gave birth to you and to me. I just close with this because we're, I think we're coming to the end of our time. Um, all of you who've had little children in your lives, either as your own children or nieces, nephews, etc., know that one of the things that little children do all the time is they, they ask about their own day of birth. They're so like fascinated by it. You know, what was it like and where did you go? I mean, I can tell you to this day, because I remember asking my parents a thousand times, what happened on the day of my birth? It was a Friday, I was born in Arkansas, it was a Friday, my parents were going to a movie called The Main Event. I don't even, I should see the movie, I feel like after all these years I should. The Main Event, Friday, June 22nd, 1979, and that's when the moment happened and they had to go to the hospital. Um, children are so fascinated, what happened on the day of my birth, how did it come about? It, it's this sense of like, okay, go back to the origin. There's this endless fascination there. For John, who now reflects on behalf of all of us, what was the day of our birth like? It's connected with this apparently chaotic, horrible, painful day in which everything seemed out of control. And yet, what was, what was the control? What was the glory? When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the lowest and last place. So, an idea of how to enter more deeply into the passion, not only, I think you want to have, um, you want to have the perspective that each of the four Gospels gives us. The strange Gospel that people usually don't know what to do with, John's Gospel, is the one that can help us kind of see from the perspective of many years of fruitful contemplation that what we want to do, and, and I'll just tell you one more last little thing about how this appears in the exercises. Remember the grace we're praying for in the third week. It's a strange grace. It's to 
a company to be with Jesus as he's going, to be with him in sorrow because he's sorrowful, to be with him experiencing pain because he's in pain. It's not to be the temptation always with us in the exercises. Is I would prefer to be in his place, to not really let him do it for me. John gives us a good kind of corrective there because I cannot, there's no possibility of my being in his place or simply um, emphasizing the pain and the suffering. When I allow myself the, the distance of love, then I can see, oh my golly, this is unbelievable. What I'm witnessing here is unbelievable. It's this marvelous gift of uh, profound love, God going to his cross.